Good morning. Welcome to New Hope. Let's see, this would be the last Sunday of the year, right? Do you remember the first Sunday of this, of this year? I, it was like yesterday for me, when it was a new year, a new decade. Anyway, we're on the last, last home stretch here. Um, but I welcome you here today. God is good, amen? amen? Would you stand and sing with us? Keep me from all 
nothing can change the way that you love me. Nothing can change the way. Nothing can make him love you less. And nothing can make him love you more. You can't, you can't, your, with your works, you can't affect his love. His love is constant, unchanging, and nothing can change it. Amen. You can't find a relationship like that anywhere except Jesus. Amen. One, two, three, here we go.
So good to worship the Lord. Let's, uh, as we prepare for the message this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? God, it's so good to be in your house. It's so good to worship you. And Father, I just pray that this Christmas, this season, we would be overwhelmed with your love, your love for us, and we would understand what an incredible gift it is that we've been given with the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, overwhelm us. Father, we long to be in your home, Father, and Father, we know that this world is not our home. We're just passing through, so Father, we pray that we would be good stewards of everything that you give and how you bless and how you minister, we would be good stewards of, God, and let us be people that carry the hope and the light of Jesus Christ into McPherson and into this world so that more could come to know you as their Lord and Savior. That's our heart's desire. God, we also pray for our church body, those that are sick or going through a difficult season, Lord, or maybe a little bit lonely right now. Encourage them, Lord. Lift them up. Heal them, Father. We trust you. You are a good God. So, Father, we cry out to you that you would heal and, and move and encourage and, and lift up the spirits of those that are going through a difficult season. God, but our hearts are overjoyed. We love you so much. It's, it's joyful that we cry out to you, we pray out to you, and we praise your holy name. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles, we can go ahead and pull them out. We're going to be in 
Luke chapter 2 this morning as we kind of continue on with the, the good news, the this birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. We've looked at the end of chapter 2 a couple weeks ago and we looked at chapter 1 last week. We're going to look at chapter 2, kind of the main portion of it this week. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. It's amazing if you've looked on and I hopefully you spend a lot of family time, you're able to get together and enjoy the Christmas. But if you look on Facebook or social media, isn't it amazing all those perfect pictures we put out there, you know? The, you know, I don't know about you guys, but it seems like my kids have different smiles. You know, it's the smile where I have to do this, you know, and, and maybe the uh, I'll do it for, you know, for a little reward. And then there's I'm really excited. And you kind of tell them which smile to put on for the photo. And it's amazing all the pictures of presents and everything we kind of pose. It's kind of becoming a little bit of a trend to show the, the, the after and the before effects. Because I got to be honest, sometimes getting to church can be a challenge, right? Any parents out there for real, you know, any, you know, just getting the challenge, you know, to get up and get ready. But we come to church, it seems like we have it all together, don't we? You know, but we're pretty messy, broken people, to be honest. And I just, uh, to begin this morning, just a little funny video, uh, just kind of showing you how you maybe, uh, what it's looked like to show up at church and maybe a few moments before we get to church. I want to show this to you real quick. Ready, and then we'll get going. No. Okay. Hey, what? you just lay out their clothes because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. Seriously. Jack. Well, we're already late for church. Hey, you Brian. Go get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh, ooh. I'm gonna make you waffles. Can I have a sandwich? Yes, but you gotta make it by yourself. Back. Okay. This is all I could find and the zipper's broken. All right, I'll go grab a safety pin. I got the high score! <sighs> That's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. I need you to stay still, okay? Honey. Everybody needs to eat. Here you go. I need one. Here you go. Okay, here you go. I forgot my shoes. Oh. Honey, we gotta go no. back. I wanna take off my shoes. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're <gasps> going what? We made it. Yep. All right, be honest. Anyone ever feel like that? Get to church. Yeah, we can sometimes, we are imperfect. It's a mess sometimes, but you know what? Here's the good news. I want you to know Jesus Christ loves you. People that have it don't have it all together. The people that, you know, feel broken at times and people that, you know, we're going through tough seasons. Jesus came and says, I love you. 
And so we're going to look at that. We're going to see that in this story today as we look at some favorites of Jesus. So if you have the story of the gospel, the good news, Luke chapter 2, verse 8, we're going to read this. So here's what it says. You can follow along on the screen as well. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And I hope you, if you're an underliner, underline that, for that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you who is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped lightly in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. So there was a lot of people. This is an amazing scene, okay? Here the angels were out, and they were all of a sudden the, the, the angel comes to them, explains, and then there's this heavenly host that appears. And it's an incredible scene, but I got to tell you, I also think that there's a lot of other places that would have made sense for that heavenly host to show up. I mean, it could have been maybe in uh, the palace of Herod, a big, luxurious place, and Herod was the you know, king of Israel at the time, just a few miles away. That might have been a beautiful place for the heavenly host to show up and to sing. Another one might have been you know, Rome. Rome was really at that time the capital of the whole world. And that would have been incredible. That would have been a great place. And maybe another one would have been if, you know, they had gone to the temple in Jerusalem and, and gone into kind of the, the high priest chamber. That would have been a beautiful place to sing. But no, this is what they did. They went to the shepherds. And they sit, the angel shows up and this heavenly host shows up. That's who they chose to announce the birth of their Savior, Jesus Christ, to. And this is incredible because really, who are the shepherds? The shepherds were, you know, pretty people that were illiterate, you know, didn't have a lot of education, you know, and they, here they proclaim peace on earth to the people he favors. So we're going to look at this morning, I'm going to give you four characteristics that we see in this story of who the Lord favors. And we're going to see that right here from the very get-go, who are the shepherds? The shepherds, like I said, didn't have much of an education, but I think a lot of them, if we think about shepherds, I think about the, the Christmas programs, don't you? Everybody's kind of fighting to be a shepherd and put on the robe and the hook staff, and everybody's like, it's kind of cute, and we all think, ah, oh, you know, wonderful. But the thing is, the truth of it is, it was anything but cute to the ancient Israelites. You know, shepherding was kind of the lowest of the low, okay? They were the bottom of the class, and, and they were unskilled labor. And, you know, what shepherding, what people would usually hire is, you know, maybe pay a, a couple kids to do it. And they might, people just passing through that needed a job. But if you were an adult Jewish man, and you were still shepherding, let me tell you, life had not gone as planned, okay? It was not, you know, basically life had been kind of a total failure. So they were kind of the poorest of the poor. And their testimony, if they were to give testimony, people wouldn't even believe them. They wouldn't even listen to them unless it was verified by somebody else. So that's who the shepherds are. And so we see that of all the people in the world God chose to announce the birth of Jesus Christ to, he chose the shepherds. And so we're going to see in this story four characteristics that Jesus favors. So the first one is this, if you want to write down notes on the back, you can, is that he favors the poor. You know, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks, and we've seen how Mary and Joseph didn't have a lot. They couldn't present the lamb at the sacrifice. Instead, they present two pigeons or two doves. And, you know, here I want you to know about angels. Um, the angels give it to the shepherd, and he was declaring, I see you. You matter. I, I care for you. I love you. If you don't have, you know, a lot, and he wants to bless them, but he blessed them with something more than even financial gain. He says, I want you to know about the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. I'm giving you the best news ever. And I think sometimes when we don't have all the best cars and everything, and we're not so full of, you know, filling ourselves like, I don't even need the Lord. But when we're more empty-handed, that's when we say, you know what, we're in a better situation to receive the greatest gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so clearly, you know, we need to be generous to those that don't have a lot. And we, I want to, you know, this church is incredibly generous. 
Uh, I got to tell you, you know, in the last couple of weeks, it's amazing. People have come up and say, hey, would you bless someone? And here's some groceries, bless somebody with it. And our church body um, as well, this last week, we wrote checks for, as a missions team for over 23,000 going out to bless and to grow and expand the, the gospel, the good news. We have a Jesus film team that has a whole backpack and they're going to go all over planting churches. We're taking care of a, a village in Guatemala. We're going to try to give them water this next year. And it's incredible to be generous, but God's got a special place for those that say, you know what? I don't have a lot. I need you. And he gives the greatest news to this, uh, these shepherds because they don't have a lot. So we see that he clearly favors those that are poor. The second one he favors, uh, as we're kind of going through this, is he also favors those whose lives are a little bit messy. And I, I got to tell you, shepherds were not a group of people that had it all together. They just didn't. They just, you know, their lives, you know, they weren't at the top of the class. They weren't, you know, uh, maybe they didn't have, when people talked about them, they didn't talk about them in a very positive tone. You know, people, basically their lives had just kind of gone off the tracks. So maybe you feel like this. I don't know. Maybe you feel like your life's a little bit messy and it's frustrating when you see others and it seems like they got it all together. They got the job. They got, you know, the, you know but sometimes I want you to realize that Christ says, hey, if your life's a little messy, I love you. I care for you. I want you to know I notice you. And Jesus actually says he favors you. That's the truth. And so here we uh, have one of the best names, I think, that God gave Jesus in the book of Isaiah, through the prophet Isaiah. He says he is the wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Here's the word for counselor in Hebrew. It means a reliable guide, someone who leads from a place of authority. Now, this isn't just a counselor that comes along and says, it's going to be all right. It's okay. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. No, this is someone who will gui is guiding you through problems, the ups and downs. And in the darkness, he is the light. That's who we have in Jesus Christ. And he's like a shepherd. You know, he, no wonder the angels appeared to him because, you know, the angels, the shepherds knew what it was like to be lost and need to find their way. And so that's, he, they could have related to that, needing guidance. And I love this name, Wonderful Counselor, because you know what it means? It means that Jesus came for people who have problems. Maybe you have some problems. Maybe you have some difficulty. You know, you don't go to a counselor when everything's great and perfect. You don't say, I just wanted to spend an hour with you, and here's $150 of my, you know, resources. No, you, you go to a counselor when you feel kind of lost, or overwhelmed, or exhausted, or stressed out, or confused. And this, this is probably the most obvious statement possible, but every miracle of Jesus began with a problem, right? It did. He didn't just go around saying, I want to tell you about who I am, the Son of God, and I'm going to, you know, guess your weight within a half a pound. No, he didn't do that. You know, he said, you know, you've got some issues. What did he do? He healed the blind, he cured the sick. He, in those storms, he calmed the storms, and he also multiplied food for the hungry. That's what Jesus did. So here's the good news. You got problems. Hey, you're in line for a miracle. God wants to do a miracle in your life, and if you don't have problems, let me tell you, you probably should come down, and we can pray after the service, and God will give you some problems. You know, we can pray for that because you want to be in line for God to do a mighty work in your life. So maybe life's a little bit messy, and maybe you've been kind of carrying these burdens these stresses all by yourself. And what I want to encourage you to do is lay them down at the feet of our wonderful counselor and let him bear them with you because he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. So Jesus came for those who are poor, those that have lives are a little bit messy. And the third one this morning that he also came in uh, favors is that he also, uh, those people that feel forgotten. You know, shepherds, were known to just be, by society, just kind of not noticed. They were forgotten. They were kind of left behind. Even by their families at times, they were kind of forgotten. And nobody would go to, a, you know, kind of a party and just brag on their kid who was a, a shepherd. It was kind of like, no, he's still a shepherd, you know. And so they were forgotten. And yet God favored them. And maybe some of you feel that way. I know the last several months have been difficult. It's been kind of hard to see people and maybe you feel alone or kind of broken or forgotten or overlooked or maybe you're even listening online today and you're saying, hey, do people even notice? Do I, do, do I even matter? 
Well, let me tell you, you matter. You matter a whole bunch to the Lord. He loves you and he has not forgotten you. In fact, he's chosen the shepherds to say, I haven't forgotten you. I see you and you matter. I've, uh, I've always loved Psalm 139. And, and in your time, you might want to read through the whole psalm. It's incredible. But I'm going to read a portion of it because the, in Psalm 139, the author's kind of wrestling with feeling forgotten. And he's saying, Lord, do you even know me? Do you even know what's going on in my life? And maybe you felt like that lately. I want you to hear this. Psalm 139 says this in verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. In verse 4, it says, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. Verse 7 says, Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? If I send to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, a word for hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness, the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me, uh, about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day. For darkness is as light with you. In verse 13, it says this. You form me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. In verse 16, it says, You saw my unformed substance in your book were written. Every one of them, the days were formed before me, before there was even a single one of them. You had a purpose for me. In verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand of the sea. I am awake and I am still with you. This writer is basically saying, hey, I'm, this is like a dream. I can't believe you love me this much. You know me this much. You think about me this much. So if you feel forgotten, let me tell you, you're not forgotten. How much do you think God thinks of you? I mean, my goodness, look at this. He saw you in the womb. Before your mom even knew you were pregnant, there he fashioned you and he formed you and he gave you a specific uh, design and a purpose for you. He loves you. And he says, and I ordained all of your days. You know, he laid them out and he's watched over you in the good times. He's watched over you in the bad times. And when it felt like darkness, it says, no, no, to you, you are the light. How much does the Lord think about you? This should overwhelm us, I really believe. He says in this, he says, I thought about you more than anything else. You know, the sands of the seashore. Now, I thought this would be interesting. How much do you think, you know, the sands of the seashore, how much is the sand in one cup? One cup. I didn't count this, okay? I looked this up. I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to lie to you. I looked this up. Two million. Two million pieces of sand in one cup. I mean, my goodness, he thinks about you. Who have you thought about for two million uh, times? The Lord notices you. You matter. You have value. You're not forgotten. But so often we can feel that way. I want you to know, you said you, you want someone to notice you and know that you're special. Well, you are special to the Lord. You're special. Do you, you want to know that your life matters? Well, let me tell you, you matter to him. You matter to him. And all of, you know, he, he favors the poor. He favors the messy. He favors the forgotten. And one more he favors. He also favors the guilty. Shepherds, I got to tell you, were considered dirty. They were considered, like I said, they're, they're maybe dishonest. They, they're, uh, they're what they would think and say in a court would never be used. So they were kind of dirty and dishonest. But now, you know, were they guilty more than anyone else? No. They're not guilty more than anyone else. Of course not. The difference is that the shepherds were aware that they're guilty. That's the difference. And a lot of us, we kind of go on in our life. We think we got it all together. But, you know, the angels chose to make the announcement to the shepherds because he knew they knew that they needed a Savior. And that was important. You see, the truth be told, all of us are in God's eyes, kind of like the shepherds were in Israel's eyes. 
The Bible tells us in Romans 3, 23, it says, For all have sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God. And that means, you know, that every one of us falls short. And when we hold our lives up to the, the light of God, we see all the impurities, we see the sin, we see the selfishness, we see the lust, we see the brokenness. It's, we see how, you know, all those struggles and sin that is in our lives. And Jesus came and he says, you know, I, I recognize, I see what's going on. I wanted to have the good news go to the shepherds because they know they need a savior. They can see their sin. They can see their struggle. And so I wanted you to know, you know, yes, the gospel is good news. Why do we call it good news? It's not just also for bad people. The gospel is only for bad people. I mean, that's the truth of it. Because there's only one kind of people, those that need and recognize him as their Lord and Savior. He came for you. What good news. What good news we have in a Savior in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know Jesus' main ministry. He didn't just come to kind of give us good advice and kind of just, you know, you know kind of teach us or be kind of a life coach. His ministry was this, substitution. He lived the life that we were supposed to live, and he died the death that we were condemned to die in our place. Jesus is our substitute, and that's why it's good news and not just good advice the good news is that Jesus came as a substitute to save, to save those that were lost, and that's every one of us, to pay for our sins. And now, through the resurrection, he's given us his spirit so that he can give us new life and change us and transform us. So Jesus, we see, favors the poor, those that are maybe messy lives and forgotten, maybe guilty. And this is what he says to you today. He says, unto you, is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Not someone with just good advice, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And I pray that we would know, maybe we understand a little bit better who it is, that the, why God chose the shepherds to appear to. Because they were in a posture ready to receive it. At Luke chapter 2, we're going to go up and we're going to finish this in verse 15 through 20. And this is what it says. And when the angels had left them, and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and both, found both Mary and Joseph, and the baby was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. So what did the shepherds do? How did they respond? I just want to see, obviously, they said they returned glorifying and praising God. I mean, what incredible news. What other else was there a choice to do but worship him and sing praise to him? I mean, here they had a Savior, and I think a lot of times, like Christmas, you know, we all love to receive gifts, right? But the thing about a gift is you got to receive it, and you've got to open it. And sometimes, you know, if we just, kids, if we just put this under the tree, and you're wondering, do I ever get to open it? Well, you see, yes, it has your name on it, and you receive it, and you open it up, and that's what we have to do with the gift that has been given to us through the Lord, through a Savior, Jesus Christ. Your name is on that gift, and all you have to do is surrender to Him and invite Him in to be your Savior. So they received Him, they rejoiced, they were overwhelmed with worship, and the last thing they did was they told everyone. It says they went out and they responded and they told everyone, and everybody was amazed. I mean, how could they not? This good news, this is incredible news. They went out and shared the news with everyone else, and I got to tell you, yeah, that's part of our role as well. If you know and if you've received the gift of Jesus Christ, we need to tell everyone else. We need to be people that share the good news and the hope of a Savior, Jesus Christ. I got to tell you, um, I've been watching, maybe you have a lot of Christmas movies, you know, recently, maybe you do too. Uh, I made my boys probably three or four times over the last couple of days watch It's a Wonderful Life. Um, you know, I love that one. And also, remember that scene at the end when Mary's kind of saved the day and she clears off the table and George is just hugging the whole family. Can't wait to see him. But all these people come rushing in with money. Well, what's the song they sing? They sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. 
And so I want you to hear this. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild because God and sinners reconciled. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Mild he lay his glory by, born that no more may die. Born to raise the son of earth, born to give us second birth. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. If you receive it, hark the herald, angels sing, glory to the newborn King. So maybe we grasp a little bit more of why He showed this good news first to the shepherds. Because maybe life's been a little bit messy. Maybe you feel unfor, you know, forgotten. Maybe you realize that you're guilty or maybe you just don't have a lot. I want you to know today, receive the gift. The gift has your name on it. Open it, receive it, and let the Lord Jesus change and transform your life. And then we go and we tell everyone. And I pray that we would be telling others about the good news of Jesus all throughout the year. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. What an incredible example that you shared this good news with the shepherds. And Father, at times we feel pretty broken, pretty messy, and life may not feel like we have it all together. And Father, there's good news. You love us. You notice us. That good news is for us, and that good news, that gift has our name on it. And I pray that we would open it and receive that good news today, a relationship with Jesus Christ. We surrender our life to you, Jesus. Make us new. And Father, if we know that good news, help us to be proclaiming that throughout the, the nation, throughout McPherson, that many would come to know Jesus as we boldly talk about the blood of Jesus and the substitute for our sins. What a gift that is. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close in worship.
Amen, amen. So good to worship with all of you uh, this morning. Um, today was supposed to be a celebration of Jill's ministry. Uh, we sent out an email about a, a week and a half ago that she um, needed to spend more time with her kids, so she was going to be stepping down. But I got some good news that she's staying, and I'm so excited. The uh, elder board worked it out, so, so she will get some time. We want to make sure that she gets time with her kids. But we're so thankful for her ministry, her heart for the Lord. Um, her husband, Mark, their whole family are just an amazing gift to our church body. And so we're so thankful she's staying. So there is still cake, okay? So you still get cake, and it's more of a celebration, but I want to encourage you, you know, as you have time, you know, send thanks and appreciation. Um, Jill just does a wonderful job with the whole team in leading and leading us to the Lord, and that's an incredible gift. And I want us to never take advantage of that. So we just thank you for Jill, your ministry. We're thankful that you're staying and continuing on. It's a real joy for us, and we just appreciate her. Let's give her a big hand. I'm really thrilled about this, so it's just wonderful. So that's good news, and you still get cake afterwards. So it's a win for everyone. Uh, Here's the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a happy new year.